So before handing it over to uh, our uh, speakers, I will introduce them briefly. I will go in order of the images that appear on your screen. Bruno first. Bruno Fodibaya is an associate prof at uh, Educational Science and academic director of Centre de Pédagogie Universitaire at Université de Montréal. Uh, he is a researcher, member of the and the Education Fund de Capacitation du Florian. His work is on the usage of digital tools for learning, co-author of uh, the uh, digital framework. He is interested in digital literature, the processes for adopting innovation by teachers and their uh, professional development. His research currently is on virtual reality and artificial intelligence. Norman Roy, he is a prof at the Psychopedagogical Department at the University of Montreal, director of the research group, inter-university group in uh, integration of technology. Uh, he uh, is passionate about the usage of technology in education. His main interests in research are emerging technology, virtual reality, uh, creation and uh, uh, creative tools, and digital tools. I, I, artificial intelligence as well. Normand is constantly seeking to understand the potential of digital tools in education and the conditions to implement these tools. He's also interested in distance learning uh, for youth as well as in higher education. Kistin, she has a master's degree in teaching and a psychopedagogy uh, doctorate. She is at Saint Jerome Cégep. She is a, a researcher. Kistin has done and continues to do research funded by PARIA programs, FRQSC and Nova Science, as well as doing mentoring in research with new researchers. Kistin is interested in pedagogical and didactical practices, as well as experimenting new practices, integrating VR and uh, science uh, tools for learning. Maxim, Maxim Link. He has a master's in political science at Université du Québec à Montréal and a diploma in pedagogy, second cycle. A second, uh, uh, he has teaching at Cégep uh, Planodière Terrebonne, 14 years now. He's interested in digital issues and different disciplines as well as education. In the coming, in the last years, he has collaborated at the Environnement Propice to uh, train, uh, teach citizens uh, in higher education for digital tools. Project, project that is funded by Projet de Recherche du Québec, Cité et Culture, the FR QFC. And now have a great webinar. So hello, everybody. I am uh, uh, very happy to be here with you all today. Uh, the uh, team is also happy to be here. Nicole introduced them all. So we will uh, jump into things. We're going to present the results of uh, some research we've done at the University of Montreal and in two uh, CEGEPs, uh, Saint Jérôme and CEGEP Régional de la Nodière at Terrebonne. So the plan for the presentation, we're going to shortly present uh, to uh, introduce the project and uh, the results, the perceptions of the students and teachers on chat GPT and uh, uh, generative AI the knowledge of uh, artificial intelligence and literacy uh, in, in artificial intelligence, the principal usage of uh, AI in education, teachers and uh, students, the chat GPT more specifically, issues and challenges related to using chat GPT uh, and, and generative AI, and then managing chat GPT by teachers and educational institutions. So to participate, first, we would like to get to know you a little bit more. So we're going to use Woodclap to Woodclap to see who is uh, with us today, 94 participants. So we have a couple of questions to ask. Uh, if you would like to participate, use your mobile phone or uh, on your computer on uh, woodclap.com woodclap uh, or scanning the uh, code that you see. So if I go to Woodclap, we can see here we have uh, a lot of guidance counselors, a lot of teachers, uh, some uh, library personnel, uh, librarians. Uh, there's 94 of us. So I'm going to uh, give you a few moments here. 
we're expecting at least 75% response. I'm just going to give you 30 more seconds. So these are the results. We've got almost half guidance counselors, a bit more than a third the teachers, some librarians, and other. We don't have any execs uh, that are here with us uh, today. Um, I'll come up to the next question now. Uh, how well do you know chat GPT? So answers are coming in fairly quickly. I would like to call your attention to this is very interesting because um, we have nobody who doesn't know it at all, but uh, it's uh, pretty much average uh, medium knowledge and uh, some uh, people know it a little bit and others uh, fairly well. So we're going to see uh, if that correlates to our study. So I'll, Come back to our presentation uh, here. So the issue, November 2022, there was the official launch of Chat GPT as the technology that had the quickest uh, adoption rate in history in reaching a very high level of usage in a few days only. In September 2023, it's the first time a school year started with Chat GPT. We talked a lot about plagiarism on the uh, public uh, forums and in discussions. We had a study by KPMG, a, a large uh, scale study where they did 2222 respondents. And so a pretty low number, but we heard a lot about this in the media where one third of the people surveyed use it a few times a week, the students, and one uh, a quarter a few times a month. We did a study in November, 2023, uh, by Cospedas and the Sphinx, it was a much uh, larger sample size. It was done in France, and uh, at least half the students uh, say they use generative AI at least occasionally. And what's interesting here is three quarters of the teachers, two thirds of the students, though the majority agree that they consider that using AI for homework is cheating. So. Yes, to do uh, uh, homework, to do some projects, uh, we uh, many consider that cheating uh, on uh, both sides, teachers and students. So in the public debate these last mo six months, these last uh, weeks, when we started doing this research project, we had a lot of discussions on what literacy is in AI. We were talking about literacy of, uh, of AI uh, as a digital skill. So there's more interest in... Um, figuring out what we want to educate people in when we talk about AI. So uh, we tend to the ca capacity of uh, students to, teachers to uh, uh, use the skills and uh, the tools of AI and to be able to use these uh, uh, it for different uh, 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 functions and uh, uh, using it, uh, understanding it by using it. We have some authors here who present six factors of literacy, literacy for AI. Look, uh, I'll uh, three. And we, Lepage, that's us, we just uh, uh, deposited our thesis. Lepage, three factors are three dimensions of uh, AI literacy, the technical, pedagogical, and uh, ethical uh, as well. And we have some elements in our questionnaire that are related to these elements. Our research project, we have the uh, supplementary objective here. I'm just going to present the main objectives. We wanted to measure the level of literacy in AI, the for the general uh, educational population because we had some uh, guidance counselors and uh, uh, library personnel and some uh, uh, administrators as well. So uh, it's uh, not much representation for librarians and uh, uh, administrators, but we wanted to uh, see what people thought, what the questions were. We had no uh, uh, positive or negative bias technically or technology-wise. We wanted to have a, a balanced approach. So with this balanced approach, we wanted to describe the opportunities and the for GPD for teaching and for learning, as well as the issues and challenges relating to using it. And then we how people, uh, teachers, students, professionals, how they would use ChatGPT or uh, uh, AI, uh, uh, generative AI 
and how they uh, would use it. So that's a big study we've done in the fall of 2023 uh, with the, the uh, full population of teachers and students of three participating establishments, uh, institutions. So uh, the both CEGEPs and a sample of 30% of the students at the University of Montreal, you can see here, we have in Quebec and Canada, I think it's the largest study. Uh, we'll be able to compare it to other studies, but uh, 2,773 uh, respondents, 2,400 for the students, uh, 300 plus uh, teachers, uh, guidance counselors, the librarians, and uh, some administrators as well. We had group interviews as well, where we have similar proportions uh, with the uh, student community, uh, guidance counselors, teachers, uh, and that's uh, what we base ourselves on for this presentation. So we will now, sorry, talk about the next uh, section, perceptions of chat GPT. So the first question we asked, uh, uh, the first question we asked, we asked it to the participants. We see that we're in the same proportions here. There was nobody who had no knowledge at all in ChatGPT. You're here, you're informed a little bit about it at least, but we asked the question to the uh, uh, community, we were about 10%, but it goes up to 40% that consider that they're a bit or m medium knowledge. And if you look at the experts, we're about 6%, 9% for the teachers, 6% for the students. So they know through ChatGPT in September 2023, we go back in time a little bit. There is a good proportion that did know uh, chat GPT very well. So one of the questions we asked was, are we optimistic or pessimistic with regards to the changes that chat GPT will bring? So we can see it's a neutral number here. Uh, they're uh, pretty early in chat GPT history, but there's a proportion, uh, equal proportion on both sides. It's almost symmetrical. People who are optimistic, uh, about 30 percent, 20, uh, but th about the same number on both sides, teacher and students, and uh, uh, that are also optimistic. And we look at it half full or half empty. So uh, it could be uh, we wonder, but the question we're asking is, what what do you base yourselves on? Why do you think you can be optimistic on certain things and uh, pessimistic uh, for other usages? So that's what we're going to see in the presentation. Next slide, please. So we asked them, first of all, what makes them optimistic? Well, we, this is an open-ended question. We're op optimistic for research and information. It could be a very good tool to support education and the uh, gaining time and be more efficient in searching for information, but that uh, uh, is an important aspect. We also have uh, some text here to show what we, what we mean on, re on searching for information. It's easier to have access to information it uh, can go and drill down deep on information and it uh, helps us to understand certain things. We can see that we're going towards usages that could be uh, very useful, but we don't know exactly how the tool will respond, but we can see the beginnings of all that and it's saving time and having a quick answer and uh, fairly reliable. The only issue here is uh, the fairly reliable, how we're going to uh, measure reliability. That's not... Uh, obvious uh, always and saving time is that good or bad well we don't know we can uh, see it as a good thing however so uh last slide for me so here we ask the question do you think it will change the education uh, uh industry uh, college and university people are pretty unanimous that it will change we didn't say positive or negative we talked about uh, how deep the change would be we're almost at 70 percent if you look at uh, uh People who think that it will change uh, on, on both sides, teachers and students, 70% on one uh, side, 72% on the other. So it's around the same proportion uh, that agree that things will be changed uh, because of this technology. So in our research, we also did some interviews with uh, 32 people, group interviews with 32 people from the community, 22 uh, people uh, from the teaching staff, and then uh, in these interviews, we asked people to describe very um, frankly their perception with uh, regards to chat GPT with open-ended questions. And the word clouds here that are represented, the size of them is proportional to the number of people 
who uh, uh, brought up these themes, these uh, issues. So we can see here a lot of the same language comes uh, back again and uh, perceptions that are positive and negative. So if you go to the next slide and you can see the image here, uh, uh, the uh, table, you talk about the student uh, negative perceptions, uh, what comes out the most is in exact information incorrect information that can be a problem with ChatGPT, uh, ethical considerations, uh, the plagiarism issue, the fact that it's limited, and also in terms of uh, positive perceptions, the, the fact that it acts as a tool, as an assistant that can help us, and that uh, it came out a lot, and also the fact that it is efficient, that uh, uh, as uh, a time uh, uh, gaining tool helps us to uh, gain time and offers different possibilities for usage. So these are the perceptions, positive and negative, from the uh, students, from the teachers. Same thing, a lot of uh, as uh, as much positive as negative. And as I we see here, these are the same issues that come out. Uh, so the fact that you can be in danger of getting incorrect information, ethical considerations as well. The fact that the development is a really quick, a fast, and that it's limited, plagiarism issues as well, and uh, positive perceptions now, uh, the fact that it can act as we lost the slide, the fact that it can uh, be an assistant and that is uh, efficient, uh, effective. So we have a few quotes here to uh, Leon, a student who says that it has biases and false information that uh, can be present because it has no knowledge of the real world. It's not like Google. So just to tell you, we haven't necessarily chosen quotes that illustrate uh, one side or the other. These are uh, quotes that uh, reflect uh, the word cloud uh, that uh, we have been. Exact, a student, he says, when I ask him questions in my area of expertise, it loses uh, uh, its uh, uh, place quickly and gets lost and makes mistakes and doesn't correct them or corrects uh, later on. So uh, Mario talks about, the teacher talks about hallucinations because ChatGPT does that sometimes, information that is completely false, uh, wrong, or does not make sense. So for positive perceptions, the theme that came out the most is the assistant usage, uh, using it as an assistant. Karine uh, thinks that it's a great tool that can help a lot. Matsil, the student, also says that it's very useful as a support tool. Uh, for example, to uh, do text uh, revision corrections or correct code. And FIL is a teacher, uh, uh, as a judge, uh, as an assistant, his, uh, the task is to do uh, 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 repetitive and uh, uh, easy tasks that uh, we don't want to do as humans that will save us time because we have uh, uh, imagination and creativity. Uh, so we make it do uh, base tasks. So um, I'm going to talk about the knowledge of an, the artificial intelligence and the literacy on uh, uh, artificial intelligence very briefly. So the first thing is we ask all the people involved what they uh, did for information to get information about ChatGPT. The first means is information of information is to, to have discussions with colleagues. That's how people learned about uh, uh, ChatGPT, the teachers and students, uh, by discussion. Uh, the social networks are a tool for students, mostly for teachers, the uh, online resources and uh, uh, literature, and then um, participation in the discussions, conferences, or webinars. There's a lot of that. And one fifth, approximately, of the teachers uh, said they participated in training activities. Uh, uh, was interesting, but also we had the participation in uh, workshops. Uh, uh, but it's really low, it's barely on, on the screen. So there wasn't so many workshops of this type of uh, on-hands training for teachers or students. So how well do you know ChatGPT? Uh, I will look at this pie chart again, we've already seen it. It's pretty much 60% that know it fairly well, well or really well. You can see here, these are the scales of the, the literacy, uh, literacy tables for uh, ChatGPT. That was for one to five with an average of three. You can see that the level is really average. We have excluded from this table those who answered not at all, uh, but uh, the uh, level of 
uh, skill is not very high in general, but the sensitivity to ethical issues is very high. That's good news. So 4.5 on uh, 6. So the capacity to for usage or the uh, capacity to use it, there's something surprising, is that the students, probably the capacity to use this tool, it, uh, their capacity corresponds to their usage in real life. So with regards to technical ability for students, we see a big spread between the usage uh, and technical knowledge from uh, teachers and students. So uh, we see this spread as well with professional uh, people as well, with the guidance counselors and libraries. For teachers, it's pretty close. The teachers seem to use it and know uh, somewhat how to uh, use it. Uh, so we have a question here uh, that asked for a definition of what chat GPT is. Some examples, it's a conversational agent specialized in language. It's a way to measure liter literacy. It's not a very complete answer. Another uh, answer here, a conversational robot that uses AI that allows us to act uh, to have access uh, quickly and for free to an infinite uh, quantity of information. It's not a perfect definition, but it's a, uh, another one here is a conversational tool that, uh, that uh, 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 scrapes the web and synthesizes content available from the web. And the, another one is there's a web interface where a uh, computer program based on a language uh, algorithm uses uh, machine learning and, uh, uh, to generate uh, text and uh, language models. So that's a closer definition. We questioned the respondents on the trust and their definition. And we can see here for the students, it's really uh, average. And for the teachers, what corresponds to the uh, parameters that we measured for uh, knowledge of AI. It's not really high, but uh, it's uh, still higher than the students. So uh, in terms of strategies to obtain answers with ChatGPT, uh, it's pretty interesting because we see here different uh, strategies, good ones and uh, not as good uh, strategies. So uh, ask uh, clear, concise and uh, simple questions. More than half people, uh, the people said that. For me, that's not the right way to interact with ChatGPT. You have to give them a lot of context. You have to specify a lot of things and really give a lot of dimension to the question and be more in a conversational mode. So keywords, that's a bit worrisome because you want a more complete image than just uh, uh, keywords. Uh, trial and error, well, that's a little bit better, but the only category that corresponds to the right strategy is to detail, define, explain, specify, ask more questions, and really get into detail. So uh, there was only a quarter of the people who answered that, but it still uh, remains interesting. So for usage of ChatGPT, uh, we had an open-ended question uh, for which we received more than 2,000 answers that asked, what were the uh, ways you were using ChatGPT? So for the uh, student community, we notice that the main usage of chat GPT, depending on the number of respondents. So first is to search for information and then uh, to study a subject. So when the students use chat GPT, they use chat GPT to study, to drill down and help them understand certain notions to revise an exam, for example, for a uh, educational activity. So it, uh, for, of more than 200 people answered uh, in this way, generating ideas, uh, uh, revising uh, uh, text, writing, uh, translation, uh, praising. Uh, uh, so these are the uh, more frequent uses. You can also look at the usages that were given and the and categorize them into four. Uh, the usage more with programming and mathematical operations. So. Uh, more than th a bit more than 30 answers. Uh, more text-based usage, where there's a lot of usage there, generating ideas, revising uh, uh, a text, etc. Uh, and uh, for uh, studying uh, to help us to uh, drill down on a subject, and also a few uh, related to uh, studies, uh, studying that are a little bit less frequent. So the uh, respondents, uh, they didn't only want to describe their use, but to uh, uh, 
judge the quality of the answers, the answers they got from ChatGPT. So we see that for different usage, the quality of answers is good or very good. So we uh, we uh, search for information, uh, studying a subject, uh, revising the text, generating ideas, usage for which the quality is good or very good, and the usage for which the uh, uh, usage the quality is uh, bad or very bad. So I have the same scale on both uh, sides. So there's much less usage for which the quality of answers is bad or very bad. So in the three main ones, uh, studying a subject, tracing uh, a text and researching information, searching for information. So they uh, said that the uh, uh, answers uh, given were uh, not as good. So what the students say on this, because we ask them these questions on their appreciation of this tool, but to justify and uh, to drill down a little bit on their position, we, um, the usage that we see most is research of information. And I'd like to call your attention to the uh, second uh, one. So a search uh, like uh, Google is a usage that we see the most. We use it as uh, a, a search engine. And then for research information, it's much faster to use AI. It saves a lot of energy and undue uh, uh, work. So it uh, saves time. And it's what uh, Norman was talking about earlier. So the efficiency and uh, gaining time allows us to get straight to the point uh, in having some reliable sources as well. We can have a better triage of information. So ChatGPT, that uh, is a, a filter. Uh, um, a, uh, for information, I use it a few times in, uh, for research at Bing to help like, me to find relevant uh, uh, articles and uh, uh, not too many mistakes. OK, uh, so now the same students, not the same students, but the same kind of students have the uh, more negative uh, perception of these, uh, something that we see often in these negative perceptions of these students is the second one. Finding sources online, the links are dead ones, dead links. So uh, it says try this link and test it. I've done it about 20 times and clicked on it and it didn't go anywhere and it goes to uh, a bridge to nowhere, basically a dead link. So um, the uh, superficiality also of the information, so very superficial level information and um, the can give us more specific answers and gives us a little bit of a facile, easy answer. So um, now for um, studying to help us uh, learn, uh, you can see here that doing research in history that could have taken hours of work, uh, gaining time, gaining efficiency. These praises help me to uh, confirm if I understand uh, a subject without having to read the whole uh, text. And it's a great opportunity to have uh, access to this uh, tool uh, that allows me uh, to uh, skim information like this and pricey it. So also uh, we, uh, to uh, draw up an outline as well and the plan. So it's something that's pretty useful. It, it reduces the research time, the time to search for ideas. I can concentrate my uh, 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 efforts on uh, ideas that I found interesting from that GPT. The other part also came uh, often is asking questions when the when the answers from the students were not clear, it helps me to understand when the teacher didn't give a complete answer. So we have some students who asked ChatGPT to uh, provide uh, more complete answers uh, or uh, things they hadn't understood in class. As well, uh, negative perceptions. Um, so the same issue, uh, uh, insufficient content or uh, superficial. Uh, that is not sufficient in the academic uh, world. So uh, geopolitics, for example, a uh, very basic knowledge, no uh, critical analysis, no uh, uh, opinion based on anything, presence of a great bias as well. We want it to be objective and then, uh, well, it's not. It uh, blocks many answers and uh, blocks many uh, uh, answers if they find that it's too sensitive or uh, so taboo subjects are not as accessible, it's kind of censored. So uh, uh, in red, uh, the, the ideas uh, were uh, already known in, uh, for me. So uh, once again, the, uh, the superficiality in the answers and a bias that was uh, present. So that uh, uh, is uh, for the negative comments. I'd like to call your attention to the fact that it's not good at math. Then this third comment is very bad at math. So we can see the uh, here the personal uh, usage uh, uh, by the uh, teachers. Before that, 
I will send you back to WooClap. We have uh, teachers and guidance counselors here. We're asking you, uh, how do you use uh, chat GPT uh, 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 as professionals? So I'm going to load the question here. You'll be able to answer. We're very curious to see. No usage for now. Generate examples, testing it by curiosity, brainstorm, research of information, reformulate, uh, uh, doing a precy of a text, uh, ideation, dissecting ideas. Uh, uh, the none comes out a lot. Okay. Reformulation. Uh, Generating ideas, research, uh, text uh, used uh, for correcting text, researching information. So we see a wide variety of uh, usage. So, uh, coming back to the presentation. So it's a bit interesting, the word uh, cloud and WooClap, but I saw many different usages that... Uh, came out in our research. So for the uh, teachers, the teaching personnel, what uh, appears the most is uh, it resembles a lot to the answers from the students. So research of information, uh, text revision, uh, writing, translation, generating ideas. I uh, heard the word inspiration or ideation, evaluating tests. Uh, um, and if we go to the next slide, so these are the main categories of use. If you look at uh, these different categories, we can specify three of them, the same as uh, for the students, op mathematical operations, programming mainly, with 15 answers. So uh, about 200 responses. There's a lot of them that didn't, uh, that said that they didn't use it uh, see, for teaching. Uh, uh, evaluations and tests, what does that mean? Well, so to test our evaluations with ChatGPT. So to see how uh, ChatGPT can do the evaluations and run the tests we give the students, planning pedagogical activities, it comes out second, preparing evaluations. And the third category, which is uh, text-based. So revision of text, uh, writing, uh, translation, generating ideas, uh, precy, uh, et cetera. So, the same uh, principle here. We asked for these uh, uh, usages. What were the uh, usages? I mean, the quality of answers was good or very good. So for the teaching personnel, there's research of information first. There's translation, everything that is text-based, uh, revising text, uh, generating ideas. Uh, and uh, for uh, usages where the quality is bad or very bad, we also have research and search for information. And uh, the, with the comment that Nicole just uh, put up in the chat, there are different ways of uh, researching information. There's maybe an exp explanation there that uh, uh, you can use to find uh, information. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, testing evaluations as well, where the quality was bad or very bad. And there's part of the explanation here on the types of research that we do in the comments uh, about the efficiency of ChatGPT. So you can see here there with specific questions, uh, key concepts to evaluate if it was a source of information that was useful for students. The answers obtained were better than what I expected for certain concepts. The same way, in the same way, testing the capacity of finding information on concepts that are very uh, obtuse or very specific in science. The content was very good and the answers were excellent. Uh, or maybe explore a subject that I don't know very well. So there's uh, some uh, uh, paths for new exploration or testing, uh, um, experimenting different things, if you will, uh, regards to uh, positive usage. Now, the negative perceptions, we hear this a lot, and the students mentioned it, but for teachers, it came out much more. Uh, but to find references, scientific references, um, the uh, most of the references didn't exist. 
so finding information uh, answers seem good but they're invented or they're wrong a lot of hallucinations and frequently it's a, a source of bad information and uh, there's a, not a scientific source or artificial source of information so there's a presence of bias as well and i question chachati on the uh, theory, the gender theory because it's a uh, social science uh, area that is uh, stuck in a certain agility and I, the, I found that the answers uh, lacked a lot of nuance and had an ideological bias so that's one of the things the students said for translation it's uh, where we received the comments that are the most uh, unanimous in general translation of uh, text is uh, very uh, good very useful much better than classic translation tools and it uh, may interest language or linguistics uh, profs who uh, are listening to translation you have to uh, do some corrections and some you have to fix uh, things a little bit here and there but the, it's uh, general very efficient from french to english translation is impeccable uh, about no comparison no corrections i uh, compared the answers with a professional translator and it, it came out very good so um it's a bit more negative is when maybe you could reassure some uh, teachers that uh, haven't tested their evaluations yet but when you look at the tests that were done and so on a uh, for example a composition uh, an essay so they went uh, around in circles la lack of structure very general and superficial the uh, references were false uh, so uh, propose one of these subjects uh, uh, for uh, a, school, a course project. The answers were superficial, uh, go around in circles, and the answers were wrong, hallucinations, uh, and incorrect information. And uh, so I copy pasted uh, the uh, evaluation, and it didn't uh, respect the rules and didn't follow uh, and didn't uh, really work out very well. So that uh, came out very strongly. Now, uh, challenges uh, and issues uh, for teachers and students. So when we asked the question, uh, we did a basic analysis, semi-automatic analysis, to really see that uh, it's around the key words, plagiarism, cheating, and there's also this idea of loss of, competence, of competency, loss of skill, and uh, depending too much on this tool. So. Uh, we look at the uh, coding, the word clouds that uh, we've had from the interviews on the uh, the biggest uh, 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 issue that comes out is plagiarism, loss of aptitude, so loss of skill, or will we will allow AI to replace us? And on the left here, for the uh, students, we have this uh, inexact information, the quality of data, the quality of the information, uh, intellectual property, and evaluation and learning as well. So the same type of issues and risks that are brought forward by both uh, students and teachers, this idea of plagiarism, uh, inexact uh, information. Uh, and so for plagiarism, it's not surprising. The risk is uh, we could use it to answer in our place instead of uh, helping us to do so. So that's something we've documented very well and we've seen, and it's an issue. We don't always know how to respond to that, but it's easy to cheat and write a text with ChatGPT. And for the teacher side of things, it's the risk that ChatGPT does the work instead of the student and uh, in, instead of being a support. So it's a, the concept of making uh, life easier for the student and uh, getting them to think less. And so does it replace the skills or does it support and help us to, so, uh, to develop skills? Or does it just replace those skills? So the uh, concept of inexact information, we're talking about uh, incorrect sources. We uh, saw very quickly that, and we put ChatGPT in a, a big category here. There's a lot of derivatives and other uh, with, uh, tools and other plugins, but the uh, sources used and sometimes are wrong, and the interpretation of these sources are wrong. ChatGPT sometimes is uh, inexact or uh, it doesn't tell us why it gives us a certain answer. And so uh, what, uh, and it invents things sometimes, hallucinations and associations that don't exist. And here, I see this issue of uh, IA literacy. Uh, 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 so when we see when ChatGPT invents things, we have to understand what it's doing. So there's a bit of a, an issue here and understanding AI. And so uh, uh, there's a, we have to understand why, why it does this, why it invents things that doesn't exist uh, in exact data. So loss of attitude, we uh, have that here as well. So to slow down the brain, just use AI and uh, 
uh, Raphael talks about uh, depending something on something we don't understand fully, and it's a bit risky. It may become a religion for some. So this idea that a robot, we don't want to lose our skills, our capacity as a person. We don't want to be dependent on something we don't fully understand. So uh, it's this idea of the GPS that uh, replaces our sense of direction. So this preoccupation, this worry as, uh, uh, for students as well as teachers, it's a real preoccupation on how to keep the skill level up and develop the skills uh, of the students. So how to manage generative AI, how to use it. The next slides come from data that was gathered from interviews, those done with a member of the teaching community that accepted to participate as well as uh, uh, other uh, educational professionals. So we asked some questions. We asked the students, what is the management? How do we manage ChatGPT as a tool by your teachers? So the most people said, just allow us to use it. Then train the students, adapt our evaluations, integrate ChatGPT in classroom activity train on the usage of this tool and two people said limit usage so to allow usage it wasn't in contradiction with not allowing usage at all and so there's a student here who said uh, 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 she said that don't use it well, well why she said it's not smart to uh, tell us not to use it because it makes us want to use it even more and motivates us even more to go and explore and uh, use it because it's verboten. So uh, for training the students, well, there's a student who said, well, of course, if we want to use chat GPT more for education, we will have to have some training, some teaching on how to use it, how it works, how it can be useful, and what are the limits of its usage. And then in the interviews with the teachers, we asked them how do they use chat GPT in their classroom? And um, nine people said managing plagiarism. Nine others said allow usage, training the students, uh, adapting evaluations, uh, uh, train people on using chat GPT and limit usage for answers. So uh, managing chat GPT uh, by the teachers uh, that participate in the in the interviews. And so to manage plagiarism, well, I think you have to have some tools. Uh, Sonia uh, says this, she's a teacher. She has uh, to have some tools to catch the teachers. She talks about the value of diplomas and the reputation of the educational programs, but also something that I heard uh, from uh, students, the students that are honest, Nothing bothers them more than knowing that some people beat their score by cheating. So to allow full usage, there's a teacher who says, I give the possibility to use it for the simple reason that I cannot control the usage. So rather than putting their head in the sand, he uh, 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 understands that people are going to use it regardless. So another thing we asked about the, uh, of the teachers is, how can you manage chat GPT on the institutional level? And the answers obtained uh, is to train and educate the teaching staff to have a framework for usage, regulate the usage by policies or frameworks or regulation, or to uh, um, cite to uh, uh, say when you're using it, respecting academic freedom, and also allow full usage. So. For training and educating the teachers, Nathalie said we should offer free training, continuous education, and uh, uh, have that as part of our job, how to use ChatGPT and what are the best practices. And for uh, uh, Pascal, a teacher, for uh, having a framework and rules for using AI, he talks about the institutions that must stay aware and must uh, stay abreast and educated about uh, this tool and the impact on plagiarism. The institutions have a great role to play in terms of their expertise and knowledge. They really must have the knowledge of AI and chat GPT and uh, have some funding 
to have a committee of experts. Thank you, Kristin. We're going quickly to the conclusion now. Thank you, everybody, because we've uh, kept uh, time. It's interesting that there's a call for administrators to be trained on AI to be able to decide uh, in an informed way about policies and uh, actions that are relevant. So we wanted to have something about that. We don't have a lot of administrators with us today. Uh, we don't have any, uh, we usually have a few. And so I think uh, at the administration level, they will have to develop uh, their own literacy and training around AI and chat GPT. So if you remember the results we uh, covered at, at the beginning with regards to the knowledge of chat GPT and the, uh, the uh, capacity to use it, AI literacy. So the teachers and the uh, students and professionals in education are all similar. There's a lot of heterogeneity uh, with 40% uh, that don't use it a lot or a little bit. and um, some that have medium skill level and students who say that they use AI at a very high level, higher than educational professionals and teachers. But that's something that's a bit worrisome for the students because some of them are very, very uh, well versed and they have good strategies and use these tools even in a positive way sometimes. And they uh, sometimes they may not use it positively and it's uh, worrisome and their capacity uh, of using it is so much higher than uh, and their technical knowledge about it is also pretty high but there's a positive side to it in a way because it allows us to be aware of all the risks but there's still um this wish from both sides that the usage be allowed but uh, uh be regulated and that there should be a framework and not put our heads in the sand and understand that it's there. And we have to get used to it and use it and learn about it. So the teachers and students have to position themselves and the institutions have to position themselves in this way. So there's something we didn't talk about in detail. So the risks, risks identified by these students and the personnel, the teaching personnel is interesting, but there's a lot more risk that we can cover. There's ethical uh, risks. There's risks around transparency, or privacy, um, the ecological footprint as well, and how we use uh, uh, models to train, to, to, to humans to train these AI models. So we have a, 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 this vast initiative that we have to undertake for AI literacy. We really all have to uh, get on uh, the bandwagon for uh, AI literacy for both teachers and students and administrators, first and foremost, who will decide the policies, then uh, educational professionals as well, who will have to uh, train uh, librarians uh, uh, as well. And uh, so on AI and ethics related to AI, the usage of AI tools uh, in education. So the different ways that chat GPT can you, be used, different ways it can be used, what it does well, what it doesn't do very well, and understanding the algorithms and how they function so that you can understand the risk and have a, a better uh, usage of this tool. So another thing we find very interesting is there's a vast initiative in literacy that we have to develop, but it's something that could be interesting in developing resources activities, training exercises that can be shared uh, for um, in higher education and in uh, education in general for uh, learning about AI. So that uh, is our presentation. We wanted to keep uh, some time uh, for questions. And I think we have a bit more time for questions. We we did a pretty fast presentation. So I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, Nicole, uh, over to you. And that's great if you have some time because there are five questions. There's about 12. Well, there's Jean-Francois Tessier and well, that's six questions. So a lot of ground to cover, but 
what I hear about AI. I've given a lot of webinars, written a lot of articles on plagiarism, and the same solutions are suggested as to to personalize the work, to give an opinion on it in the classroom, but also to not stop people to learn about AI or using these tools because they're going to use it anyway. So anyway, we'll see. I know it's not very ethical what I'm saying, but uh, people are going to use it anyway. So the first question that Norma answered uh, is, Evaris was asking, have you ever looked at ChatGPT to a, a, to for cognitive development? Uh, no, but the uh, uh, students were interested in the subject and talked about it during the interviews and said that uh, it was something that was covered uh, in uh, some of what the students said. We talked about the usage on one side or the other and the issues and preoccupations. The other questions now where there wasn't an answer so far, the first question from Catherine Tremblay, in a survey, people uh, see that education is not as relevant. Students see that education is not as relevant because AI and ChatGPT can find all the answers for them and think for them, and so they don't have to be as educated. So um, you can uh, go ahead and answer uh, that, any of my colleagues, if you uh, would like to answer. What we saw in some of the open-ended questions was a bit of this issue. And I talked about this earlier, the fact that, well, and anyway, I don't have to read this over again. I could just use the chat GPT to, uh, and so um, what comes up a lot is uh, laziness. The fact that I even worried some people said I, think that I may become uh, uh, a bit lazy intellectually. So normally it wasn't a repudiation of education or anything like that, but there was a preoccupation that was very clear about uh, this laziness that would grow uh, uh, through time with chat GPT. I think that it's a real risk in the sense that uh, we can talk about uh, uh, being dependent on it, but the fact that uh, for a tool like that, um, uh, for augmented intelligence or hybrid intelligence that uh, combines both types AI and uh, human intelligence. So the AI will be used for developing uh, cognitive capacities of humans. So what, So that means that they have to use it to help us to uh, increase our intellectual efforts and not use it too much as a crutch, but there's a real risk. And I... I didn't see this in the research, but I heard this a lot in conversations in hallways and uh, students that worry, uh, what's the point of using, uh, of learning all this if we have AI uh, now? So this is a very incomplete answer, but it's a very relevant and pertinent question. Now, questions from Jean-Francois Tessier. Does, will the government will adjust uh, upwards the competency of the programs and the general skills to include uh, digital literacy, in your opinion? So will the government level up the skill level in the programs for digital literacy? Uh, well, it's something we would like to do. And I'm just going to segue uh, into, they call it something, somebody asked the question, I'm segueing into uh, that, but they talk about digital literacy, AI literacy, this idea that the skills that we have to develop is there's literary, uh, AI literacy, a uh, digital literacy that we have to develop at the, in the AI age. So we have to think about that eventually. How uh, this uh, literacy, this uh, this these a knowledge about AI uh, relates to digital skills and also in educational programs, all kinds of uh, education, because uh, it's uh, said everywhere, and there's uh, one of the conclusions of the Conseil d'Innovation du Québec, and we will have other information next week with the Conseil d'Education on the importance of developing certain skills and competencies with AI and how it's going to influence the job market. 
So yes, this is work that we're doing to actualize uh, the landscape, and uh, of course, but there's a lot of uh, things to work on. It's going to take some time to see how uh, it can be included in different uh, educational programs and technical programs and uh, uh, different levels as well. Sometimes it, it could be very influential uh, throughout uh, different uh, subjects at university and different levels and in agriculture, for example. So there's a lot of thinking and uh, a lot of exploration. And uh, so one of the doors we want to take is, should we do it separately or within uh, the uh, framework to develop uh, uh, digital uh, tools? We have to use that. I think that's uh, we have a good tool there. We have to use the AI lens with that uh, uh, framework for digital skills. We have to make these adjustments in time. So. Uh, we have something we can add, some activities we've done in, in the digital uh, education days and some exercises that participants would see all the different dimensions uh, of the digital frame of uh, reference to digital tools that we are developing. So I think uh, Kistin will answer, is it possible to prove that there's illegitimate use of this tool to write text at home? Well, it's a worry that came out a lot uh, from teachers to say uh, the tools currently offered to detect plagiarism through AI are not up to speed. So to prove uh, that, I would say no, we can't really, but it's more by raising awareness and by education and other verification methods like as soon as there is a doubt to validate the work that was done because i don't think i don't know if my colleagues can support me on this or not but i don't think you can prove well norma can talk about the best tool possible for me independently of the value of the tool it's a strategy that i find very doubtful to use uh, software, uh, not necessarily doubtful, but, uh, but uh, questionable, but the, to use that 100% and to trust it 100%, I don't know. See, uh, uh, Charles Jardin, uh, 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 talking about this on the radio, uh, uh, he, I found it very interesting. He uh, went to Catholic school and his writing was so good that he was accused of plagiarism. His mother defended him, but there was such a motivation and that she, decided to prove to everybody, well, first his uh, mother went to bat for him and he uh, was proven right. And the teacher uh, was suspended for a few days and had to apologize. So what do we do with false positives? 92% is fantastic for a tool like that, but what about the 8% who really did the work and that are falsely uh, accused of plagiarism? So there's all kinds of problems with false positives. I know, Norma, you thought about this. so. Uh, uh, over to you. So, well, I say this a lot, but uh, the race has been lost, but independently of the tool, there's GPT-0 and there's ChatGPT. there's a, uh, you can have your own detection tool and, and there's too many false positives or too many false negatives. So the door has been open, but we have to think about certain forms of evaluation. I think that there's an issue there. The solution is not fully developed yet, but We'll be able to really prove uh, uh, that it's been written by AI or uh, not, or if it's plagiarism of people used uh, three or two, three uh, tools, a bit of AI, a bit of Ansidat, a bit of other software that can paraphrase that. So, so imagine then what it'll be to dismantle, to disentangle all of that. So I don't think you'll be able to really do that. The people are worried about that. It's a legitimate fear because they really want to find ways to evaluate uh, it fairly, but in thinking sometimes you can use other tools, other uh, strategies and uh, to look at the final project and the product and to uh, me and Bruno think about all the different steps to document the project and to uh, document your work and uh, different ways to uh, do that. But it will always remain an issue. I think it's not an issue that we have an answer for uh, today. I agree with you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I was saying at the time when I was giving workshops on plagiarism. Evaluate differently. There's not just essays that can uh, allow us to evaluate uh, a student. There are many other tools for evaluation. 
and uh, the portfolio approach can be uh, um, very interesting and uh, useful, as Norma was saying. So, for plagiarism tools, uh, with Platoon, uh, which is a detection tool that uh, uses AI, and it uh, uh, generated a lot of false positives. So be uh, careful. Uh, so tu rentintin is a tool that you have to be careful of. So questions related to plagiarism. Um, another question. Uh, these are uh, fairly extensive questions, and time is uh, fleeing. But uh, I'm going to ask a few. Well, we have a question related to what we're talking about for plagiarism. Robin asks this question. What is your uh, uh, position facing uh, using a clause? Uh, in uh, the rules that would uh, stop using these tools, that would not allow anybody to use AI tools. It is, there's rules you know, that says that you can't use them unless it's explicitly allowed in the class. It's a, uh, uh, in uh, the regulations. So uh, uh, plagiarism uh, for uh, both uh, cycles of study for uh, superior education and, and uh, at the in Montreal, and it's uh, not possible to use these tools unless it's explicitly allowed. So, but I don't think that's sufficient to just uh, uh, worry about uh, plagiarism. There's a lot of opportunities in education that can uh, need to be uh, regulated with AI. And so, uh, sorry. Uh, yes. So, we will, Jean-François, we will come back to your question, but a lot of other questions as well. So, we will talk about Raphael's question. How to do a verification of plagiarism by AI. We talked about that. Uh, so uh, uh, there are other verifications that can be done, other ways to verify. Um, I don't know what you think, but as we were saying, there may be ways to change the evaluations instead of verifying the work that was done that may be a source of plagiarism. So if you want to have more specific information. Uh, uh, if you want to give more information, go ahead. There's also, Marie says, is, is AI not part of digital literacy? Why do you separate them? Uh, or what is the next step to go beyond uh, uh, simple perceptions and have some knowledge and understand the ethics and the uh, usage of uh, uh, AI tools with the general population? I think Norma already answered uh, part of that question. Well, I've already answered that I agree that uh, for that aspect, but the second part is the knowledge and, and ethics. One of the challenges we had and we were asking about when we started this study is the people, the, the perception in the beginning. If we ask for specific questions, too specific, we may bias the answer. So if we want to go a bit further and open ended questions, it's not, we don't exactly know what we want to evaluate or measure in terms of knowledge or uh, 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 an ethics around AI, but what do you do? Uh, how do you use these tools? So what could we evaluate? But I think, yes, the next uh, studies we will do, we will be more interested in this kind of thing. I think that in, in general, on uh, the skill level and knowledge of digital uh, tools, and so uh, people's perception, feelings, things like that, uh, skill level and uh, comfort. But I pretty much agree that we're going to have to go further uh, and another wave of study to see uh, uh, what the knowledge is around this, what people know, what their comfort level is, and uh, uh, knowledge around ethics. And there's, it's coming in the next wave of studies around AI. We're going to go beyond just perception, but perception indicates that how people uh, perceive things, what names they give to things. So if I give a very specific question on how do you train ChatGPT and what are uh, different parameters and machine learning, or if I I have very technical knowledge, et cetera. You could find our, our yourself with very little results because people, uh, so there is an issue there. So for me, we are doing this with research assistance and uh, re re literature review on what has been uh, uh, written since 2018 on uh, AI literacy. We're doing a literature review of that and we give you a snapshot of, of that, but to deploy an initiative around that, we'd have to know what uh, we want to look at and how we want to train the teachers and students around AI. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Um, in the interviews with people with whom we discussed uh, the 
students as well as the teachers, everybody talked about the need for training. Um, and so um, the teachers should be trained and uh, teachers are also asked to be trained. So what form can this training take? It's a bit, uh, we have a lot of information under the form of discussions, uh, but it seems to, we had some things that show that when people want to be trained and what are the different usage, how can we use it? What are the ethical issues? Uh, 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 good knowledge is not perfectly clear for everybody. And I think that, uh, yes, that's where we're we are at. Thank you, Maxim. I see that there are some questions uh, around evaluation, if we want to go more towards the process than the final product. But so the, uh, the modify their modalities for evaluation. And so you've done a lot of work in QA and quality analysis. What would you answer to that? Because are people using that for uh, evaluation? A lot of teachers, uh, yes, they do that. They modify their evaluation methods so that plagiarism is not a big, uh, as big a problem. I, a lot, I saw a lot of uh, adapt, adaptation, a lot of examples of that, the idea of the process, showing the process. Some people uh, say that uh, uh, to, for example, in social science, we ask uh, for a, uh, an outline and then uh, you have to sit with each student to ask them to explain their outline, what they want to cover. Somebody who would have generated that with AI cannot really explain all of that. So that type of direct verification and contact, that we have to do the evaluations in class. That So I'm keeping the same spirit and questions. So to, instead of doing this with or homework or at home exams, I do it in class. Um, so we're really trying to, uh, Teachers are trying to control what they can control in the different methods pedagogically. So other people go further and integrate ChatGPT into their evaluation. So as we said, some people say, well, this or that part of your text, you will generate, you will do a first iteration yourself that you will submit to me, you hand in, and then you will uh, submit the uh, version generated by ChatGPT. So you will hand in both. And that's just a few examples that come to mind, but clearly, there's many more uh, uh, teachers that try to adapt uh, and than others that put their head in the sand. And so uh, it may be uh, interesting. So uh, Norma, uh, and Ray, so this is the opportunity to uh, draw a conclusion on uh, this subject. So let's go around the table here, Norma, Kisin, Maxim, any uh, final thoughts? Well, I'm just gonna take a question in the, in the chat. It'll be my closing um, statement. Yes, we hear this uh, a lot. The students are gonna use it. It's there, it's on the uh, labor market. And so what I hope is uh, though we don't necessarily have to use ChatGPT to help us with writing. We, we, we talked about that. We don't wanna replace uh, human skill. We have to develop. Uh, our uh, skills with AI on the job market, on the labor market, how we want to use it and what we're using it for. And in education, I think there are some places where we don't need to use AI, but we have to be able to train and have understanding of this AI tool to be able to uh, mobilize it and use it in different ways. So I don't think that it has to be everywhere in education. I don't think it should be a crutch because it can write an email for me for the rest of my life, but I have to learn to answer emails myself, but this tool will be available, so I have to be able to uh, use it. So for me, this literacy, this digital literacy, the AI age is important to integrate. Uh, it, one day you will see uh, uh, AI uh, illiteracy as we saw for digital illiteracy uh, in the 2000s. So I think there will be some thinking around somebody who doesn't know AI, will he uh, be 30, 40 years from now? Will it be an illiterate person? So we have to see, we have to go back in time. We have a time machine. We saw this change in paradigm with digital tools as well. So I don't know, we have to train. On. Well, the closing remarks, uh, I already gave you uh, those with the last answer I gave. So uh, many of the data for, uh, come from research shows that we are at a point where we, we need to 
teachers and students, we need a relevant uh, training education. Um, what form it will take, who will give this training exactly and what it contains, we don't know yet. But with this training program, to be able to raise awareness and educate people, I think that it's very important to aware, to raise awareness and uh, uh, be able to use AI adequately. And let's be on that. It's, it's in interviews, and I saw that uh, too. I saw this in the chat as well. Uh, uh, there are teachers that have a uh, uh, a bit of a head start and uh, and uh, using it for evaluation, and they just want to share their knowledge. And so I think that that as well uh, uh, could be interesting. Thank you, Maxim. Yes, often the institutions uh, uh, are a bit behind on these issues. Uh, institutions in, in education especially they're a bit uh, behind so for me we have to catch up quickly we have to move fast uh, but in a responsible way in an intentional way uh, for all different uh, stakeholders in education to be able to uh, take advantage of uh, this and understand the issues and uh, the two students who benefit the most or can suffer the most so can develop I think um, uh, knowledge and a critical uh, thinking around this. What we saw a lot that was an issue is for the student population a lot more than for uh, uh, teachers. So it's really an absence of critical thinking generated by um, the ethics and the usage and of that also the teachers need to be educated and raise awareness and educate uh, the students as well. So, uh, Maxim, thank you. So, I think, yes, plagiarism is an issue. Uh, we have to worry about that. We have to not make it the center of everything. There's all kinds of other issues, a lot of other biases, preoccupations, a lot of risk. Uh, but I think we have, have to be able to promote a relevant and responsible usage and responsible usage of AI in superior education. I think it's possible that it will trans form uh, the educational sphere and we have to be in the sweet spot is to try and use how we can use it ethically responsibly and allow us to build uh, skills and develop education. I think for that, we shouldn't be limited on one ped day here and there. Uh, we have to have a training program that is pretty extensive and to train all the stakeholders in education. Nicole? A lot of questions and answers today and answers that bring forth a lot of questions. For me, it uh, will enrich my understanding for sure. And at the same time, um, a lot of these worries that are totally legitimate and I am anxious for all these discussions in the world of education and some of the obstacles that stop us to use these tools and all the possibilities they offer and, and especially in this digital era where the students uh, are such users of these tools but it requires a lot of work a lot of thinking and i would like to thank all of you again i would like to thank the participants if you want to leave a comment uh, here uh, Daniel Nadeau, uh, and you, if you can, I'm going to copy that and uh, I'm trying to put that uh, in the chat. I'm going to uh, include it in the chat document that you will receive uh, later on today. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Christine. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you, Bruno. It was very interesting, and I hope we'll have the opportunity to continue. Uh, this conversation. Thank you. Thank you to the AQPC. We'll see each other at the AQPC at the collective.